Hey, I'm Rena Friedman Watts, host of the Better Call Daddy Show, which you can now listen to on the new cool.fm. That's K E W L.fm. And I am excited to be here. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on the show by a very talented and creative person. She is the host of Better Call Daddy show a podcast which is uh, amazing to hear and listen to if you haven't had a chance to do that we're joined by the ever talented rena watts how are you doing today i am doing awesome i love your voice wow i am on with a pro <laughs> well i think it's partly genetics and partly the fact that i did three years of call center work so you know i had a soothing voice apparently <laughs> love it love it i <sighs> think i would have been good in a call center too <laughs> Yeah, you say that now, but when you work on it, it's not that great. <laughs> but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. What am I bringing to Two Geeks Talking? About 20 years of media experience. I got my start at an NPR station in college, and I loved it. Not only was I reading the news and the weather, but when no one else was around, I was singing and creating air check tapes and having all kinds of fun in the booth. And now, 20-something years later, I won't give away my age totally, but I have found my way back to radio, which was an old love. So it's pretty crazy. I started a podcast about three years ago with my dad, my number one fan, who's always wanted me to be on stage, although stages kind of scare me. I wanted to do a show with him because one, he's been my biggest supporter. He's always encouraged me to go after my dreams and go after my talents and my gifts. And he's a total character. So I thought that the audience would appreciate that. And, you know, if you need encouragement in your life, or if, you don't have a relationship with your dad, you can adopt mine. And that theme has really kind of resonated with my audience. I've gotten sperm donor daddies. I've gotten inspirational fathers. I've gotten absent father stories, fatherless daughters. The range of daddy stories is vast. I listened to a couple of your episodes. You've had some amazing guests on the show, I have to admit. The last one I, I listened to was episode 300, which is a major milestone for any show for that matter, not just a podcast. And that was with the, the author of The Chicken Soup for the Soul, which was an incredible listen, I have to admit. It was a very free-flowing uh, interview to be said for sure. Like, congratulations. Thank you. You know, I was just talking about that episode with another podcaster this morning. And what I found truly amazing about him, I mean, he has written 318 yeah. books and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. But aside from that, he is just really able to express himself freely. And that to me is an incredible le level of success. Like, he can say pretty much whatever he wants because of what he has accomplished. And he says it articulately. Yeah, definitely. It was, <laughs> it was very, very riveting for sure. I was listening to it. It was a, an hour long conversation, which is amazing. And I think he got maybe five or six questions in because he was so engaging and so entertaining and everything like that. And I think that's, that, that's the best thing for a host to have is an engaging guest. Oh my gosh. I have had a guest one that I asked, I think, one or two questions to, and he took over the entire show to the point where I was like, we have to do a part two. Like, there's so many questions I still want to ask you. Some guests are able to just go on, and that is a, a gift and a talent. I can't do that. But there's also the opposite side of the spectrum. Sometimes you'll get guests that are very introverted or just not as engaging as some of your, your past guests. How do you deal with that type of situation? I would say I do my research. If I'm going to have a guest who's introverted, I want to know what they enjoy talking about. What do they post about on social media? Where did they go to school? What are they doing for a career? Are they a father? I have a list of questions in case I need to draw from them if the conversation might need to go another direction. 20 years in 
radio and podcasting is obviously a, a long career and I'm with you there. I've been doing this for like 15 or so years now. I have lost track to be perfectly honest, but it's, it's an amazing journey to be had looking at your journey from when you started in NPR radio to where you currently are. What have you learned as not only in, as a host, I should say, but also as a person? Oh, that's such a good question. It kind of goes back to the question you were just asking, you know, how do you get an introvert to do a good interview? Being able to read people and not making people something that they aren't. In the beginning of my career, if I had a great guest who was going after the audience or really lively, and I wanted to sometimes repeat that with the next person who wasn't that. And you have to be able to figure out what's beautiful or special about the next person and not try to replicate stories, but be an active listener and also be pretty thorough researcher. Some of my best interviews, even on the other side, are people that scrolled back through my 25,000 tweets and people who listened to my interviews beforehand, like you mentioned you did. Doing thorough research on people will make a better conversation, will make a better interview. And I have learned that. And I didn't do that as much in the beginning. I think the same for me as well, too. When you when you get starstruck as well, that sometimes can really throw out all research that you've really done or if you hadn't had a chance to. Either. It's incredible. Oh, I recently and I didn't expect it. But yes, I did an interview recently with somebody who had accomplished a lot and done it at a young age. And I personally knew them. It did make me nervous, almost made me want to start the interview over again, because once we talked for an hour, we got so much more comfortable and warmer. And I feel like the beginning wasn't that banger that I wanted to start with. Do you ever feel like that where the conversation just warms up so beautifully towards the end and you get all the juice at the end and you're like, maybe I need to (laughs) re-record that beginning. How did we get here? Definitely. I've had that where sometimes a guest will come on the show. It'll be like a half hour before they you, they finally get comfortable. And it's just like, well, that ends this episode. It's just like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah of starting my podcasting journey too, since I had worked in post-production, I was just like, well, I'll just record a few bits. But when you record bits, it doesn't match. You just learn so much by doing it. And, And I think that's part of the creative process, right? Figuring out what stories resonate with your audience, figuring out what mic sounds best, where to sit, what to talk about, what not to talk about, how to frame things. Even with this radio journey now, me at Cool.fm, I am working with eight other announcers who work on radio stations other than Cool.fm during their day job. And I am one of the only podcasters. And even though I have radio experience from a while ago, there's a learning curve and I'm a perfectionist and I might record a break four times versus one time. And I want to get to the point where I'm good with recording it and putting it out into the world. It doesn't always have to be perfect. And I think that People like a little flub. Especially if you don't have time to edit. That's the other thing. Editing, I think a lot of people don't understand the editing side of a podcast. And it's easier with audio than it is with video. I've been editing a lot more tightly since the pandemic. Looking at interviews that you've done, you're trying to connect a story through that entire time frame. And storytelling, especially in podcasting and interviewing, is very difficult to, to do. It definitely is. I'm interested in what you think about even leaving in a thinking pause or leaving in a deep breath. I mean, do you leave those in? Do you cut out repeats? I cut out repeats if the thought just gets disjointed. And and that's the majority of it. I will sometimes leave in the deep breath pauses if, if they're really thinking about a question or if it really kind of makes them pause. Situations like that, I'll leave it. But if it's a a breath in between sentences that kind of just feels like it disconnects it, then I'll probably take stuff like that out. And it's more work for me, unfortunately, but at least the final version, when I release the podcast version of it, sounds a lot cleaner in, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think some of it too is just personal preference. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, when my husband listens to podcasts, he doesn't like them tight. I like them tight because I have a short attention span and <laughs> I like things snappy. Even in the videos that I watch on TikTok or on Reels, I have that attention span. I like something to capture my attention right away. I like high energy guests. And for me, I also like to speed it up too. I'll go 1.5 times yep. speed. It's just more of a time factor. It's like I only have a limited amount of time to listen to what I want to listen to seems to sink in quicker for me. Yeah. And speaking of that, so this guest that I was telling you about that I got kind of nervous with and feel like I could have done a better intro, there's different ways of even doing intros. So when I first started my podcast, I was unsure whether I should have my dad on the interview or not so he could hear it happening live or whether I should do the interview separate, cut down the interview, and then let my dad listen, and then us react together for the first time. That's what we do now. He doesn't really have the time to sit on every interview and then react. It's better for him to listen on his own, have his own thoughts, and then us talk about the episode together. I feel like that's more real too. Like we don't discuss any of the episodes until we discuss them together, which is kind of nice. It's almost like reading a book with someone like they have their own experience. You have your own experience and then you come together to discuss it. It's like a classic book club, but only with two people. So you don't have to argue with everyone else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, it's interesting too. Like I've, I've read books, interviewed guests, and then it's almost like he gets to read the book and doesn't. <laughs> It's unbelievable, though. We've talked about so many different subject matters that I never would have expected. And what else is so cool is I feel like he's changed his opinions on some of the topics that I've covered, like abortion or sperm donation or being a fatherless daughter. A lot of subjects that I don't think we ever would have talked about had they not come our way through the podcast. And I, I feel like maybe my kids aren't interested in those things now, but now they have a library of what their grandfather thought on all of these topics. And it's also a sign of the times as well, too, because looking at the subjects that you've been doing for at least these 300 episodes and your varying career as well, too, there's a lot of things that change over time. There's a lot of opinions that change over time. What are some of the subjects that maybe you revisited in your most recent interviews versus when you revisit them in past interviews, has your opinion changed on? For instance, like the sperm donor dad, my dad at one point thought he might even be interested in doing that. Like he wanted more kids and my mom was done. I think around 25 or 26, she had three and that was a pain point in their marriage. And after having interviewed someone who I think is like a sperm donor to around 25 children, my dad was like, wow, would I have been doing that to give somebody else a child for the opportunity of raising a child in a healthy way? Or was I actually doing that for ego? Mm. By hearing somebody who had actually done that, it made him think about it differently. So I thought that, that was interesting. And then I interviewed this lady who I had met by producing another podcast. She was on a healthcare show that I was producing. And she was such a great guest on that show that I decided to have her on my show. And we did it in person with a green screen. And she actually got to meet my dad in person. And she admitted to my dad that she had gone through some abuse and that she saw her sister have a child and struggle through that. And, and when she got pregnant and was in this marriage that wasn't working out, she decided not to have the baby. And it made my dad think differently, having met her in person, having seen that, you know, she's worked in a healthcare organization for 30 years. She's been an entrepreneur. She's a stand-up individual. Maybe people's circumstances should be taken into account more before you judge them. It was such an interesting shift in witnessing in my dad to be more open-minded to, to the decision that she made. I, that is one of my favorite episodes with Connie Polk. I felt like it was really brave of her to even share that. It also depends on how comfortable you are with the guests because it's that it goes back to that window of are they comfortable with you yet as, as a host or are they going through something maybe during that day or during that time frame or maybe, like you said, it's a difficult topic to uh, approach and, and broach. That is actually a really good point. 
I have interviewed people right after tragedy or right before tragedy. One of them didn't want me to air the episode because their son was missing at the time of the interview. And then when I was going to air it, his body was found. And so I respected that. I did not air the story. And then another time I interviewed the Bronsteins after their son had committed suicide. It was like a couple months after it had happened and it was so raw and I'm, I'm happy that they let me do the interview because I was really touched by their story. I had a kid the same age. I knew one of my cousins went to that school. I felt very personally attached to their story. I let them hear the edit. I let the, the lawyer hear the edit prior to releasing it. And maybe it would have even been a totally different interview had I waited a couple of years. I've interviewed people that have lost their children years after, and they're much more freer and more comfortable talking about it. But I was living in the area. It was a local news story. I knew people that attended the school. I had a kid the same age. I kind of wanted to cover it, but yes, timing of the story definitely affects what kind of story you're even able to get. But as an interviewer, as, as a host and, and talking with these people, especially with these types of tough subjects to broach here, how does that affect you emotionally and, and psychologically? Because I think that's difficult to do, especially with a 20 year career. Like how are you coping with these types of tough subjects? That's a great question. I have to say I have sleeping problems sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Some of the stories have definitely taken me days to get over. It actually reminds me of when I worked in television and people pour their heart out to you and it can stay with you. I kept in touch with one of my favorite guests from the Jerry Springer show for 20 years because I felt so connected to her story, Cher Holt, who I just had on my podcast. Sometimes after the show is over, it's not really over. There's special cases where you feel like there's a soul connection there. I feel like that with a lot of my guests. It's funny, but I'm one of those people that sometimes has trouble ending friendships <laughs> when the season has passed. <laughs> I would say a good chunk of my guests, I, I try to figure out ways that we can collaborate again. Like I listen to their podcast to see who's come into their life and maybe would they be a good introduction of expanding our circle. I do networking events. I've met a handful of the guests from my podcast in person and I love that. I do Instagram lives with guests afterwards. I congratulate them if they've celebrated 200 episodes or if they have an anniversary or if they have a birthday. It's another reason to keep in touch with them or re-advertise their show or their story. I've done update stories with people too. I, if somebody's writing another book or if somebody's doing something to be celebrated, I try to keep in touch. That's the a great thing you brought up with lives and with spaces and everything like that, because that's how I found you, which is out of the seven, eight billion people in the world, the fact that a social media platform has a live platform like a space is there. And you were just talking about the marketing side of things and you're talking about introducing podcasts to people and uh, Pixie as well, I think was on there too. And, and a bunch of other, and it was just a great creative space that I was kind of in a lull doing this for 15 years. You know, you get into a bit of a lull, you get into a bit of habits and everything like that. But your space was a great outlet because it was just like, okay, we, we there's people that are doing the same thing that we're doing. That we're interviewing people or we're showcasing, or we're providing talent and a platform in many different respects. And it was just a great way to just outreach and just talk, right? Because we ask questions. We never get to really talk. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I just want to say 15 years, that is incredible. And I know you've done thousands of interviews. That is major dedication. Yeah, I used to do two to four hour interviews um, in the very beginning of the show. For the first four years, we were doing two hour interviews. I've only done a few of those. Hmm. I can't imagine doing that on a regular basis. It yeah. is a lot of work and it is exhausting. If you really care about the interview and you're invested in the interview and you're doing active listening and you're being curious, it's a skill. It's amazing who you get on though as well too, because the very first 
and, and I'll ask this question here, and this is kind of synonymous with what I was going to say, is the very first time I got a famous person on the show, episode 10. And usually by episode 10, if a podcast is going to succeed, that's the limit. <laughs> because if you don't have technical knowledge, if you don't have good guests, if you kind of just ramble, you don't have a style. Who was the guest when you were first starting the show that you got on that was a famous person projected your show to that next level? I got Evan Carmichael to air as my first guest, but I had interviewed many prior. I heard him on Ryan Holtz's podcast say that he loved being podcaster's first guest. <laughs> I reached out to him saying that I've interviewed a bunch of people, but I haven't aired one yet. And I love your content. Can I interview you and I'll air you first? And I had interviewed one of his friends to try to get to him. <laughs> and so he went for it. And I was definitely nervous for that one. And it led to me meeting so many people. Nick from Book Thinkers, he mentioned in the interview, he does a bunch of book reviews on his Instagram and he has a huge following. And Evan was like, yeah, I think I was the first verified account to reach out to Nick from Book Thinkers. And he was like, if this interview could help you get to him, I'd be happy. I tried that and it worked. And then Nick introduced me to a couple authors. I have to say, Jerry Springer was on my dream list for a long time. I always wanted to know what was it like for him as the host? How much did he really understand of what the production crew went through to make that show go on? I also wanted to thank him for really starting my career. That was such a training ground for everything I ended up doing. And getting the opportunity to interview him and keeping in touch with his publicist, Linda, for 20 years to make that happen felt like a God moment. Afterwards, I was just like, thank you, out loud, <laughs> talking to myself and whoever of the universe. <laughs> you know, if you grew up in the 80s and 90s, that, that was one of the best talk shows. And it was called a talk show back then, not a reality show, because, you know, that kind of went synonymous in the 2000s. But if you were at home from school or whatever, you were watching soap operas, Jerry Springer, and then eventually the evening news or whatever it was. That was totally my life. Yeah. Actually, I interviewed at the Jerry Springer show. And then I also interviewed for like a production assistant role on the stock market show or something in New York. I was kind of into a guy in New York at the time. And he was like, you would work for Jerry Springer. And I asked my dad, I was like, hey, what do you think about me working there? He was like, do it. You know, my parents were in support of it. I grew up in Kentucky. It wasn't that far fetched. I felt like I could relate to the guests somewhat. My dad worked in a factory, broke up with that guy in New York and ended up that was my first job out of college. And it was amazing. It was exciting. I got to live in a big city, Chicago. I learned my way around Chicago alongside showing the guests around town. I had petty cash. I got to go to House of Blues and <laughs> different diners and talk them into doing crazy things on national television. It was a very exciting first job. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to go from that level of career to becoming an amazing host as you are currently here. How did you transition after that show was finished or your career was done at that job? What was your career trajectory after that? Oh man. What's really funny is I thought working at that show would make me a great sales rep. So I took a job at Marcus Evans trying to sell like sporting event packages to executives. It wasn't actually a good crossover. In fact, I hated the job so much that I went out for a smoke break and never came back like two months into the job. I was completely irresponsible. I was like, that was definitely not a good fit. And then after that, I tried to get other sales roles because sales was an easy opportunity. There were so many of them in Chicago. There wasn't a lot of TV at the time. Oprah wasn't going to hire me. I just couldn't find really the right opportunity. And I was like, I should move to LA. There's a lot more television opportunities there. And I'm in my 20s and I have a little savings. And so I did that with a friend. And I went from being a producer and getting in the Producers Guild of America to starting all the way over as an executive assistant to three very seasoned producers, the Kyoto Brothers, who did Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And they had been in the industry for a long time. And what was cool about working at a small special effects animation company 
company was that they really showed me behind the curtain. They showed me the business side of the film industry and what was it like to pitch a pilot? What did that budget look like? What are the accounts payable and receivable? How do you do a location scout? And I was like the executive assistant during Team America. Oh, wow. So I saw all the scripts. I saw all the rewrites. I saw everything that went into that. And I got to go to Paramount and see it all come together. And that was amazing. And then on the side, I was applying for production work to try to get my foot back into the door, which I eventually did. It led to me going on the road with VH1 and E and kind of the, at the forefront of reality TV, where I was an associate producer, a field interviewer. I tried an assistant editor, a post-production supervisor. I tried all the roles to see what I liked, what I didn't like, what was I good at, what should I lean into. Then after working on Nanny 911 for three seasons as a post-production supervisor, I met my husband online. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? That's a good question. I will say I learned that because when I interviewed with one of the executives from MTV, I walked into the room with him. He had a stack of resumes on his desk and he was like, why should I hire you? He's like, I'm not even going to look at your resume. Just tell me why I should hire you. And it was for a field interviewer role. I'll never forget this. His name is Russ Helt. I mean, that was intimidating because he had executive produced The Real World and Road Rules and all these shows. And I said to him, I can make a mute talk. <laughs> <laughs> and he went for that. And another time, even getting the job on Nanny 911, here's what a well timed one-liner will do for you. And the power of language is having these up your sleeve. Like when a podcaster asks you, what's your favorite quote? Or tell me about you. You know, you got to have these things. To get the nanny 911 job, I said, well, Bill Clinton's no longer looking for interns. So this job sounds like fun. <laughs> I had tried to send him my resume and write like a nice cover letter and be all professional. But sometimes just sticking out and being yourself and saying things that other people don't say, that works better. <laughs> It depends on how far you could push that comedy boundary between, you know, insensitive and this is going to kill. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's the power of language right there. And, and I'll say that even in radio too, right? There are rules to radio. You know, there's thing, there's rules to everything. There's rules to working in healthcare. There's rules to working in real estate and the financial industry. And I've tried all those too. There are things that you can say and that you can't say. You just have to know what you can't say <laughs> and then get creative <laughs> around the rest. That, that line's, you know, flexible, you know. Regulations. <laughs> yeah. Well, regulation. That's, that's why we podcast. Regulations. Screw that. That's fine. Yeah. Just don't say the F word. <laughs> Everything else, totally kosher. <laughs> What's wrong with saying frogs? Come on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? See, I came prepared. I came oh, prepared for this. You see, you I wrote something show. down. I wrote something down. I was just having a conversation today with DJ Flores. I'm giving him a shout out too. And he said, I wish people would get everything that they want mm. so that they would see that it's actually not what they want. I really like that. How can we be happy? It's the little wins along the way. Like I feel like today because I got on the treadmill before I had coffee. I feel like I won today because I didn't miss any meetings yet. I feel like I won today because I'm doing what I love. See, I like it when people come prepared and they actually watch a couple of episodes or whatever and see the same basic questions I've been asking for a, a few years now. <laughs> I did listen to your episode your most recent episode with the guy from the publishing company, the one who does different cartoons. Yeah, he was he was good interview. I, I enjoyed it and putting bringing together thirteen people to create a publishing company. It's it, not many people can can do that, but there's other interviews I've had as well too. And I had Phil Folio back on after fourteen years, which was a great interview because he was my, my episode ten. He was my famous person and. You know, being in the industry for 40 years of comics, you know, making his own way with his amazing wife as well. Both are creative geniuses in their own respective areas, and they've created a, a comic series for 40 years. Like things like that are just, uh, it's great to have past guests on the show. What challenges do podcasters and hosts face in today's world, and how can they address those challenges? One that I have 
seen and that I try to coach podcasters on if I'm working with them is just being an active listener. And when I started podcasting in the beginning, because I have lots to say, I actually put myself on mute. And I heard this even from someone who is a very top podcaster, Scott Miller of the On Leadership podcast. He was saying that he makes like this face with his lips sometimes where he like, you know, stops himself from interrupting. I think mute is probably better, especially in the beginning. Like you want to be the host, you want to jump in there and say something, but not interrupting, not talking on top of each other. That is something that I learned actually from the Jerry Springer show. Like you always see those guests that talk on top of each other. And it sounds like they could be arguing over a popcorn recipe and you don't even know what they're talking about because they're stepping on top of each other and you can't even understand them. So it's really important to take turns. And also like you're doing very well. It's like you have questions prepared. You've left room for creativity and left room for where the conversation could go, but you were still prepared with questions that you wanted to hit. I think that it's important to have an outline, but don't be married to it. Don't have to ask your next question. Like be free in seeing where the conversation can go. I completely agree. It's it's something that I've um, I've collected questions over the years, and in fact, uh, ten years ago, I actually changed up all of my questions. I actually completed a fresh reset because I felt the questions I was asking just felt camp. They just didn't feel natural. And it's just like I was like a robot <laughs> asking questions. It was horrible. I mean. I, I like to switch up even elements of my show after every 100 episodes. I'm getting ready to relaunch my website. I switched up the intro a little bit. My kids have gotten older and I've included them in my intro. So, you know, you know, one will say, let's switch it over to grandpa. Now I had her say, well, you've heard from my mom. Now let's switch it over to grandpa. So take something that's working and freshen it up a bit. You know, be open to new questions. Keep trying to get feedback from your audience is another really big tip. People that are supporting you on Twitter, people that are supporting you on LinkedIn, people that are supporting you on Facebook, you know who your people are. Reach out to them, get feedback from them. What do they want to hear? Who do they think would be a good guest? Which episodes did they relate to and why? Like the more feedback you can get, the more involved you can get your people in your work and how can you support them? How can you have a reciprocal relationship? In fact, I actually joined a group of, of fellow podcasters and, and hosts online and retweeting and we're talking with each other in the background. You know, Discord's a great way to do that. And, you know, it's, it's great to actually have a support system of like-minded individuals whether it's in the same genre or whether it's just promoting, you know, other interviews that they've done as well, too. People don't realize this side of the conversation is difficult because we're, we're in our own circles. We're in our own bubbles. And if, if we're yelling into the void and no one's answering back, it's, it's disheartening to a certain extent. Oh, very. I think that getting feedback is really hard. Yeah. I mean, you can see your numbers increasing or you can see analytically which episodes do better, which titles do better, which social posts do better. But you're like, you, you want engagement in real life too. You want to yeah. be invited to podcasting events. You want to be invited to lives. You want to continue the conversation. If you have a great conversation, it shouldn't be one and done. Yeah. It should be expanded upon. I love that you're in a group. That's great. You know, I started a Facebook group. Here's another tip with people that had been on my show. I actually didn't even name it the same thing as my show. I called it business laughs and LinkedIn because at the time, like I thought, you know, you need to laugh in business in order to have fun. And I loved LinkedIn. And that's really the first social media platform that I used in the corporate world. I worked for a telecom company and was a program manager. And in order to get people to come to our local events, I would advertise them or, or show the behind the scenes of the events that I was putting together online. And just by showing pictures of us all gathering and who the speakers were and what the topics were. Then other people started reaching out to me and they're like, oh, hey, where are these happening? And then I started doing that in the financial space. And then I started doing that in the entrepreneurial space. LinkedIn is where I really started building my following. And then I was like, well, I need a place after the people that are on my podcast to still like keep in touch with me. So I started a a group. And, and honestly, it's kind of like a sounding board. So I, I had a guest the other day who 
sold a company at 19 for over a million. And he's worked with some really big YouTubers. And I was like, hey, if you want to ask this kid who knows about drop shipping, knows about YouTube, knows about merch, do you have any questions for him? So a lot of times if I'm interviewing somebody about a subject that I don't normally cover, I will put in my Facebook group, hey, do you have any questions for a nanny? Hey, do you have any questions for somebody who works in healthcare and he's run a nursing home for 40 years? Hey, do you have any questions around the subjects that I'm covering? And a lot of times I'll get great questions from my audience right like that. Yeah, I do that on Twitter every so often and uh, it's helped. There, there have been some amazing questions. Of, of course, I've been trolled by a few people that were actually artists on the same comics type deal saying, Oh, Hey, you should talk about this person. And it's themselves. And it's just like, so I asked that and it's just like, no, that's, that's our artist. He was just ribbing you. Oh, gee, thanks guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I was listening to a song on cool.fm actually like Shania Twain's, uh, that don't impress me much. And then I found like a meme from elf. Like Will Is it Will Ferrell? Character? Yeah. Will Ferrell. And it's like, Oh, I only slept 40 minutes last night. I don't need sleep. And I was like, what else doesn't impress you? <laughs> right. And then from those responses, if I'm announcing a Shania Twain song, that gives me other things to say, even on the radio. Nice. Right. So it's just constantly asking questions, doing polls, documenting your journey and inviting people along on that journey to include them in your questions, include them in your episodes, include them on what you're covering. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, <laughs> I started a podcast with him. It is definitely my dad. He is my biggest encourager and number one fan. And I hope that I can fill those big shoes one day. From a professional standpoint, you've had over 20 years in the radio and television industry, and you've been successful on many fronts, especially with your amazing show called Better Call Daddy. So please keep going because you're doing an amazing work. And I can't wait to keep subscribing to all of your content as well, too. And I look forward to seeing what you do on Cool FM as well. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? That is a good question. And it is honestly something that I struggle with. I was just having a conversation about, are you really happy? That was the first question that I asked Evan Carmichael. Being happy and being successful is being good with yourself within and, and being confident. And that's something that by creating a podcast and by going after things that light me up, I am working on. But it is definitely something that I have struggled with. The reverse of success is failures. How do you deal with your failures? Mm, oh man, I call dad. I really definitely do. Whenever I am... Here's an example. I mean, recently, I... This is something that I face a lot. I had a customer that didn't pay on time. And I was like, is this my fault? Did I not make things clear in the beginning? Is he not happy with the work that I did? Like, why am I having to chase money? And I feel like that is a big lesson of entrepreneurship is knowing how to price your services, knowing how to take the right customers, knowing how to do the work that you're best at. And I am constantly failing and learning and up-leveling in that department. And I always call my dad because he ran a manufacturing company with his parents for 40 plus years. And he really understands people and he understands messaging and he understands being diplomatic versus emotional. And I have to say, I did end up collecting payment. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't have to break kneecaps. So there exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the Italian in me coming through. Well, my dad is wearing the fedora. He looks mm. like he could. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Now he's got a, a sporting uh, goatee there. I love it. It's awesome. The younger generation is looking at your work and becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, assisting with you, and I'm not going to call it child labor, but they're assisting with you in your intros and everything like that. You're maybe inspiring them on the path of creativity in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? That I love that question. And I feel like that really goes along with the theme of the show is that I want this to be an intergenerational play. I take my daughter with me to podcasting events. I, if I have a guest who is into fitness, I know my teenager is into fitness and I'll 
let him ask the guest a question. And from one of the guests that I had on my show, Evan Rabin, he is a chess master and he teaches at like 50 to 80 schools across the nation. And my oldest expressed that he was interested in chess. So even though he's not wanting to do content creation, although he knows how to edit and make thumbnails and he does that for his school presentations, maybe his way of carrying on chess to the next generation will have happened from my podcast and who I've connected to. Actually, my dad's a chess master too. So maybe instead of inspiring him to be a podcaster, maybe I will inspire him to be a chess master. I think it's inviting your children to see what's possible. And the more people you connect to that are doing amazing things, the more ideas it plants in their minds. If your life was a, well, this is kind of ironic. I'm going to ask this question because I think I exactly know the answer. But if your life was a podcast or a TV show, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? So I knew you were going to ask me that one. So I thought of an alternative answer. If it's not Better Call Daddy, who I've been calling my whole life, and I don't know what I would do without him, I thought potentially it could be from like, from Jerry Springer to, oh my God, (laughs) because I went from working in an environment where everyone took it all off to being a little bit more buttoned up, to be honest, and becoming a little bit more conservative and becoming a mom of four children. What has that been like, right? Like, how do you be a mompreneur? How do you entertain your passions and your interests and be a little bit selfish, I feel, still be a mom and pick them up from school and not be a slave to the job and make time for both. So I feel like that would be my show. Being a mom is actually important to me, even though my kids may give me a hard time about it. I do try to make that part of my brand and a part of what I'm doing and legacy really matters to me and carrying on the torch really matters to me. I've been really close with my grandparents, you know, my dad has played a big part in my life. The soundtrack probably doesn't go with that. <laughs> but <laughs> I did think of the song Beyonce. Uh, I don't even know this the the name of it. I think it's all the single ladies, all oh, the yeah. single ladies, because that reminds me, it would either be that, because that just reminds me of a time in my life where I was just like quitting with no backup plan and like going after every show I wanted to work on. And I didn't think that I couldn't get it. And I love that time in my life where I just went up. This is crazy. Like Harvey Weinstein was actually at a Jewish Federation event. He was like being honored. I was the only one in the crowd that like went up to him and like introduced myself and like took my picture. But that goes back to what I was like in my LA days. Like I really felt like I'm in my 20s. I don't have responsibilities. All I've got is dreams. And that Beyonce vibe is that for me. And then one other song I thought of, and then we can wrap it up, is my childhood before I lost that confidence and before I started questioning my abilities was we built this city on rock and roll. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that might be a theme song too, because on a bad day, on a good day, you got to rock out. You still got to just like pump up the music and remember what you love. Well, I do hate to say it, Raina, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is Better Call Daddy and everything online? Yes, you can find me at bettercalldaddy.com. And I am revamping the website right now. I'm super excited. By the time this airs, It's going to have a whole new look, but the cartoons of me and my dad will still be there. You can find me on Twitter at Rena Rena with two E's or LinkedIn and Instagram at Rena Friedman Watts. It's good to laugh. I I do know that. And uh, uh, we we have a good time together. And uh, I think that uh, uh, laughing is just as an important ingredient to the show because if you take yourself too seriously then unfortunately, uh, tears and and crying can come out instead of uh, beautiful laughter. And I think we draw from that energy as well. Sometimes have to remember not to take ourselves too seriously. And when in doubt? And when in doubt? Better call daddy.
That's right. Uh, you, you were waiting for me to say it, but when in doubt and you have any questions, tune in to the Better Call Daddy show. You'll get some beautiful answers. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our website is going through a revamp ourselves. So I'm pointing everyone towards our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT media. And the podcast is back after 15 years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or on any audio streaming service. Search for Two Geeks Talking. And of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Well, Rena, uh, what a wonderful, insightful interview you did with Kurt. You really gave the insight to the Better Call Daddy show and really shared some of your own wisdom of how you got there. But look how history of something, whether you're studying the history of a country or the history of a show or the history of a business, how important it is to be able to see all the steps that it takes and experiences that you evolve all along the way. And isn't that what humankind is supposed to be doing? The same thing. It's the same formula. We're not in the Garden of Eden anymore, where everything is just going to supposed to be handed to us. And when God tested us and says, would you want to have everything except the tree of knowledge? And what happened is that once we took a taste of the tree of knowledge, what goes with knowledge? Responsibility accountability. And once you take that bite of knowledge, then you are really on a projection of doing exactly what we're doing on the beautiful Better Call Daddy show, is building a legacy, is to building a history, to building a research communication with all peoples and sharing ideas and being able to pass it through a beautiful channel of communication where everyone can participate and learn and develop together. And isn't that what we want to pass on to our children more than anything, is to have some type of continuum where they can carry out and have an understanding of the history so that we can predict the future and be part of the future. Wow, I like it. It was a very meaningful show, and it really got me stimulated where you were able to put together this insightful path that we all should be following. What I found to be interesting, too, is how much timing plays into the conversations that we have and the lessons that we learn. Well, isn't that from the chess game? You can make a good move, but it's not necessarily the best move. But when you make the best move at the right time, then all the other moves seem to flow a little easier. So always making your best move opens up so many more doors. So timing can be everything because you can make that same move a move later and it's not as effective because your opponent can already possibly defend against a move that looked like it was the better move because they have now two moves to recover rather than one move. It's very interesting. Timing can be everything. And that's why sometimes being in the right place at the right time is a saying that's given by many people, but it has a lot of validity to it, that when opportunity really knocks and things are in the right place and people go for it, they have a chance to have better results. Those that hesitate when the timing is right, that equation doesn't necessarily have to occur exactly the same way again. So it's always best to take advantage of perfect opportunities when the time is available to do it. I think that uh, Kurt did really a very nice job that's back and forth conversation with you. It really uh, stimulated a very insightful show uh, of where the Betty, Better Call Daddy show originated and how it can continue to grow and progress. You give really uh, the tools for someone else that can do the same thing. We all can make a history and a legacy for ourselves and be able to communicate it out there. But most importantly, it has to be real. It has to be where you are giving value to all the participants 
and not where it's just about you or just about him. It's got to be where it's a united front and where everyone has an opportunity to participate and to be able to grow as well. It reminds me of a line I know you like to use is go for the gusto. That's right. You know, we we only live on this earth for a very short period of time to leave uh, opportunities and to leave possibilities without going for the gusto or reaching for the stars and going for it makes it uh, where you, you've, in my opinion, you know, people then miss out on really ascertaining everything that they can be.